Hello and welcome back to Differential Equations. We are starting Chapter 2, talking about introduction to second order linear differential equations. On the first day, we discussed the difference between, briefly, difference between linear and nonlinear equations. Now we're going to reinforce that. So we have the world of linear versus the world of nonlinear. And when you talk about linear equations, you can always first write the, um, you know, first order linear differential equation. We had y prime plus p of x, y equals q of x. That was one of the cases. But then, um, technically, anything that is not multiplying uh, function into a y, sorry, uh, y into the derivative, uh, you have no derivative squared or anything like that, or a cosine or sine of the derivative of any order, is going to be linear. So if you, if you have all of those uh, nonlinear um, ways of making something nonlinear out, then it should be linear. Um, so some of the concrete examples, like um, we're going to see today, uh, 3y double prime minus 7y prime plus y is equal to, I don't know, cosine x, that will be linear. It's okay. Uh, if you have any of the, <coughs> well, I actually have them all here. The first order, this is the second order. But you can also have functions like uh, a of x, y prime, double prime, uh, I don't know, plus, let's say, uh, b of x, y prime equals to 4, you know, whatever. So that would be linear as well. So what is nonlinear? Nonlinear would be any time you encounter, say, um, y times y prime is equal to, I don't know, x minus 3. So that will be nonlinear because of the y times y prime. Or maybe you have y double prime minus uh, 3y prime squared plus y equals to 0, whatever. So that will be also nonlinear because the square of the derivative. When I was a student, I, I somewhat thought of it as just just don't mess with these y's and derivatives in any way, uh, and then they're linear. So even if you have, uh, you can have a cosine of y prime uh, is equal to, I don't know, is equal to x. This is actually insanely easy to solve, right? You take inverse cosine of both sides integrate. It is literally two seconds to do this problem. Insanely cheap. So nonlinear doesn't mean insanely difficult to solve. It is the form of the equation. <coughs> so that cosine there makes it nonlinear. Uh, these equations will show up a lot, second order, uh, in your uh, spring mass problems, let's say in physics. Uh, so in dynamics, they will show in circuits a lot. Um, when you do your um, uh, AC circuits, you will have uh, second-order differential equations uh, pop up. And uh, we're going to see a few of these um, examples, obviously. And we'll actually do circuits, one section on circuits, which is great, because you will have those in your, I know a few of you are taking circuits now. So if you, you will uh, actually greatly benefit from those sections because you will have to do the same in your class. Um, the other thing um, that we have to talk about, apart from linear and nonlinear, is this idea of uh, homogeneous equation versus non-homogeneous equation. And uh,
So that's another classification. And um, the example would be, say, uh, you have, I don't know, cosine x, y double prime minus y is equal to e to the x versus cosine x, y double prime minus y equals to zero. Uh, in general terms, a of x, y double prime plus b of x, y prime plus c of x equals some function, some forcing function on the other side. And usually we put f of x for forcing function. And then a of x, y double prime plus b of x, oops, y prime plus c of x equals to zero. So no driving term. Now, I, I said forcing function, driving term, and so on. So if you are going to represent the pendulum with the left-hand side, which is, let's say, a swing, you have a kid on a swing, right? Uh, you know that eventually that motion is going to stop due to air resistance, gravity, and everything else. So if you give an initial push to the system and you step aside and never touch the swing again, it will stop. And uh, depending on how you set these ones up, right, it's something called the dampening will get there eventually. Uh, you see that this part of the equation will govern the actual motion of the, of the swing and the kid on the swing. So what is this forcing term? Uh, on the other side do. That's the term that if you are constantly <laughs> pushing, so the kid comes back, you push, and the kid comes back and you push. And if you're pushing constantly with the same uh, same push, but you're doing that periodically, that could be a sine function because you are applying the force and then swing goes, comes back, you apply the force. So uh, if the system never changes, like the left-hand side never changes, the right-hand side is whatever, and then um, whatever function it is. But we also have functions, um, you know that sometimes you just smack the system and then the system stop, gets, kind of starts working. Um, that's the um, delta function. So we'll learn about that as well. You, you will have those impulse functions that uh, will start the system. Uh, you will have the constant functions. Um, then you have periodic functions, the sine and cosine, and so on. So some of these functions Right, go in the forcing term um, to actually prevent system from stopping. Uh, you can just keep applying. And actually, that's where you focus, because most of the time, <coughs> um, you know, you turn the cell phone on, you want, you want it to work constantly, right? So you figure out how to do that. Cool. Um, did it give you uh, immediately? We're going to have a whole section on example like this, uh, which was the example with the, uh, the spring uh, mass spring system, where you attach springs to a, a block or whatever mass it is, and then you excite the system, and then it starts moving left and right, and then you just want to see uh, what kind of solution you get, because that function, that it's a solution to that differential equation, describes the, the motion of the of the system. So you can find a lot of stuff look, uh, looking at that equation. <coughs> so So, m squared dy dx squared, which is the second derivative, plus c dy dx plus kx equals to zero. <laughs> and 
or m squared d squared y dx plus c dy dx. Again, we'll, hold, we'll have a whole section just on this equals to some forcing function of x. So when you're looking at physical applications, you try to connect what you see on the picture and think of the forces or whatever else is present there uh, and try to see how these equations relate. So you have the motion <coughs> kind of acceleration piece, velocity piece. This is the spring itself. Uh, that the k is the, the spring constant, k. Uh, this is the displacement, right, for the, the force to figure out the force on the on the spring. So you would say, uh, let's say, use 20 newtons to compress the spring five centimeters. So you can actually figure out the spring constant from there. So uh, these kinds of equations, which we are going to develop into the detail when we get to the section. Uh, you see that they're highly applicable, right? And you can actually learn and study physical systems looking at these equations. Now, we actually want to study solutions, not just how the equation looks like, but we also want to know how to solve this problem. Now, this is uh, the, one of the cheapest problems that you can have because these are what are called constant coefficients. They're not these functions. Uh, obviously, when, it's, when you have functions there, it's much more difficult uh, to solve. But that's power series are coming up, so rejoice. I shouldn't have said that. All right. <coughs> All right. So now that we understand roughly what, what kind of animal we're dealing with, uh, we're going to take a look at uh, some uh, introductory solutions. So the first theorem we're talking about is the principle of superposition for hom uh, homogeneous equations, uh, which means that um, your uh, overall solution to the problem will be the sum of all partial solutions you get. Um, I will note that when you solve quadratic equation, Right, something uh, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. You you usually get two solutions. I mean, you you always get two solutions, but in one case they kind of are the same number, and then we still call that multiplicity two. Uh, when you solve quadratic equation, you get two solutions. Say two uh, x equals two and x equals ten. Right, so you have those two, and uh, those are two solutions. Uh, you don't get to add them, you don't get to subtract them, because 2 is 2, and 10 is 10, and that's the end of the story. But for differential equations, if you have multiple solutions, you can actually add them together, because this is the higher, I don't want to say higher dimensional creature, uh, but it's the next level up in terms of equations. So... Uh, if you have a solution for differential equation, the number of solutions, again, is going to match the order of the derivative. So for the first order differential equation, you are going to have one solution. For the second, you will have two solutions for the homogeneous part, which is just equal to zero, but then those two solutions can be added together into one major <coughs> solution. We call that general solution. So we will always represent that only as one solution. So let's just write a theorem, and then we'll, we'll take a look at examples. So theorem says, let y1 and y2 be two solutions. of the homogeneous linear equation, so that's equal to zero, on interval i, 
from one value to another. If C1 and C2 are constants, then the linear combination y equals c1 y1 plus c2 y2 is also a solution. To the equation. So this is the theorem about uh, superposition. Superposition means just add all of the answers together. Now there is a proof, right? You assume that they are not, and then you disprove that, which means they are. <laughs> That's the. Uh, it's a very simple proof. Read it in a book, and so on. So, uh, just to illustrate this with a very basic, simple example, um, you have a differential equations. Differential equation. We still don't know how to solve this thing, so I'm just telling you, all right, with all my infinite wisdom, and then you'll believe me, and then we're going to learn how to do this soon. So I'm telling you that y1, right? For, for this one, can be cosine uh, C, well, cosine X, and Y2 to be sine X. Now, try to see that both of these different solutions are actually solutions. So if you are to plug cosine here, then you have to plug its second derivative there. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. The derivative of negative sine is negative cosine. So negative cosine plus cosine is zero. So cosine definitely works to be a solution, right? Because we plugged it in and we got it. Now sine x, if you plug in sine x, the derivative of sine x is cosine x. The derivative of cosine x is negative sine. So we have negative sine plus sine is zero. So these are definitely two solutions for this differential equation. What I, bless you. What I'm going to do now is, by the theorem above, I'm going to write the overall solution as C1 cosine x plus C2 sine x. And this would be that, <coughs> what we would call general solution for this differential equation, where we um, go to the superposition of the y1 <laughs> and y2. These are also known as solutions to homogeneous part because it was equal to zero. Now you see that the answer over here is clearly some oscillation. It could be signals, could be hit on the swing, could be whatever you have. The object thing on the mass, right? And so on. So we're getting waves, right? Because sines and cosines, we're getting waves. Now the question is, right, we show that this alone is the uh, answer. We show that this alone, again, is the answer. So is the superposition of the two answer as well, right? Is it is it solution? And the answer is hell yes, because when you plug these two in right there, you take the second derivative of each one, this one pick up minus and the minus, you subtract them all to zero, and it all works. So you will be in this class figuring out these guys, but then writing them in this way. So that's technically what we have. The class says like 8, 9, what time? Oh, no, that's my calculus too. That ends, uh, I don't know. 4.50? I see some of you wanted to go to 5, and I have one request of 10. So... I just have to squeeze Cal 2 somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, the next part is the famous existence and uniqueness. So 
existence and uniqueness are two options, eternal options. They're two separate <coughs> uh, things that we look at. Uh, existence is the part where you say that the solution to differential equation exists. You don't know what it is. You just know it exists. And the uniqueness says that that particular solution is the only solution. Right? That's unique. It's a unique solution to that <laughs> particular equation. Uh, it, it doesn't. This none of these concepts are the concepts which say. Uh, that you have a general and uh, uh, general solution and the, uh, the uh, particular solution. There we go. Uh, this is on a different level. This says solution exists and it's unique, right? And you can go figure out the points and everything else later. Um, does this awful remind you of uh, that idea in a function that? You know, for each x, there is exactly one unique y, right? So these proofs um, can be done by, again, uh, assuming that, oh, but I didn't tell you this yet. So what does it mean? I have to talk about linear independence of solutions. But how is that after this concept? So two functions are linearly independent if they are not constant multiples of each other. So you know that in algebra, if you are to graph a linear line, uh, if the two lines have the same slope, they are parallel. But if they have the same slope and the same um, y-intercept, then they have the same line, right? <laughs> so. There is this notion of extending vectors, say, along the line. You, 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 do, you multiply by a scalar, you make the vector longer, you make the vector shorter. So now, uh, when you're looking at this um, uh, section, uh, the linear in the, uh, two functions are linearly independent on any interval if they are not multiples of, scalar multiples of each other or a constant multiple of each other. So you don't get to multiply one equation by, let's say, 3 and get the other one. So they will be linearly dependent. So um, now I go back to existence and uniqueness. So and maybe I should I'm gonna write it down the same way they, they have it here. So no. So theorem is on existence and uniqueness. Suppose that the functions P, Q, and F are continuous on the open interval I. Containing the point A, then given two numbers, B0 and B1. The equation, and here's the second order. I hope you can recognize this from the previous case, where I had A, B, C. You just divide through by capital A.
as the unique solution that satisfies the initial conditions. y of a is equal to b0 and y prime of a is equal to b1. So if you done your work, done your homework and stuff for the first order li linear equations, you know that there is one answer for that. You can take the derivative, plug the answer back. Uh, and then you can also compute the value of c that you get after integrating uh, by using the <laughs> initial point <coughs> or boundary conditions or conditions, whatever it's, and whatever problem you get. So the solution exists, and this is across the board. This is not just, you know, one. This is a major theorem that goes over dif differential equations. So the solution exists, and it's unique. Now, um, we are going to cover, well, we'll see it today, but we are also going to cover later uh, what happens when you have a repeated solution, uh, in which case you get to augment and how each one of the solutions so they fulfill both criteria, one, their solution for differential equation, and B, they have their unique solution, right? And then superposition is there as well. Well, there's a lot of uh, writing in this. Um, so, linear independence. Two functions. are linearly independent provided that neither <coughs> is a constant hold to that is a constant multiple of the other. <coughs> and I think they did a very good job of uh, kind of showing this. So sine x and cosine x, e to the x and <coughs> e to the minus 2x, and then e to the x, and x e to the x, and uh, x plus 1, and x squared, and x and absolute x. And that's it. So when you're looking at this, Two functions are linearly independent if they are not constant multiples of each other. So in this case, sine and cosine are not constant multiples of each other. 
sine with two times sine or ten times sine is multiple of each other. E to the x and e to the x, they are not multiples because I don't get to multiply this by a constant to make it that, or this one by a constant to make it that. I don't get to do that. I have to multiply by the entire e to the x function in some way. So all of this that you see here are linearly independent because they are not constant multiples of each other. Now, how, so let me just, I'll, here, I'll put it in blood. All of these are linearly independent. All of them. Now, if you have y equals c1 e to the x and uh, y equals at the same time, well, this is y1, y2, uh, c2 uh, e to the, I don't know, 2x. No, 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 let me do x just, so make them the same. So now, these are linearly dependent. These are. Well, I'm just going to lean. Yeah. Because if you look at this, C1 is a number, C2 is a number, and they are definitely, because the variable part is identical to the X, then you have that these are constant multiples. Now, we don't like dependent systems, right? So we fix that one, and we'll see how we fix it. I'm sorry? <gasps> Ooh, thank you. And the pen doesn't work either. I think every time I walk away, it disconnects. Maybe I should just keep leaving. What is the second from bottom left? X plus 1 and X squared. I would say it clearly, but it's not. So I, I can't. I'm sorry. For once, you'll have to take my normal comment and be happy. Come on, pen. Now it worked. It doesn't. Uh, the comment is right. If it was an Apple product, it would never, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be doing that, right? It wouldn't break. It's true, right? And I say, for most part, I would agree. But then when it breaks the first time, it's garbage from there on. <laughs> uh, all I have to do here is... Right, the first time it breaks, it's done. I just can't catch a break. I think it's time for me to change batteries. I'm just lazy. Uh, disconnects. Because the batteries are... Well, the battery. So I, uh, I'm just going to change the battery now. As the world awaits for my return on stream. Now we have to wait for the subway train to pass. Doesn't sound like. Station. Passengers. Moving on. Okay. So I have to change this into dependent. There you go. So these are linearly dependent 
and then we come up with a fix later on because we want them to be independent c2 and then <coughs> x b to the x All right, let's see what else we can talk about before we actually get into so how do we check for linear dependence or linear independence again if the two solutions are linearly uh, independent uh, dependent we have to air quotation marks fix it so there is this procedure called uh, Vronskin, uh, which is you feed your functions and their derivatives into a matrix, two by two, and then you crank the determinant of that matrix, and then depending on what you get on the other end, you make the conclusion. So let's see. Um, now, this is important concept because you will be you will be using this. So the Ronskin is going to be the determinant of f g f prime g prime, right? Which is computed as f g prime minus f prime g. I will uh, place and then erase this symbol so that you can kind of visually memorize the formula. So f times g prime minus f prime times g. And I'm going to remove the symbol now. So we can just check and see if a few of these uh, solutions are All right. Uh, well, actually, we can. All right. So let me. I'll, I'll put the conclusions here. So, if. Eh, I need red. If. W equals zero, it means dependent. If W is different than zero, Ronskin, we have independent. So that's that's what we have. So you can here I'll put it on a cloud. So let's have a few examples to figure out. So I'll start with the uh, I start with ones that I that I said we have to fix. So if I have that y1 is equal to e to the what did I put e to the x? What was my? Well, c1 e to the x, whatever. C1 is irrelevant. C1 e to the x, and then y2, oops, y2 is c2 e to the x as well. We can do the Ronsky now. So your your f is c1 e to the x, which means that f prime is also c1 e to the x. And then your function g is c2 e to the x, and g prime is c2 e to the x. So what we are going to do is we are going to now calculate the Ronsky. Uh, it's c1 e to the x and then c1 e to the x, and then c2 for g, uh, e to the x, and c2 e to the x. Oops, absolute value, so it's a determinant. <coughs> so what do you get? You get c1 c2 e to the 2x minus c1 c2 e to the 2x, which is 0, which means dependent. 
So let's fix it. U1 equals to C1 e to the x, and then Y2 is equal to C1 x e to the x. So I'm fixing it by introducing this x. So now the question is, what's the Ronsky now? Well, first of all, I have to come up with f, f prime and all that stuff. So f is c1 e to the x. f prime, easy, c1 e to the x. Then g is c1 x e to the x. And then g prime. Anyone? What do we have to do? Product rule, right? The C1x is a function and e to the x is a function, so we have to do product rule. Copy the first times derivative of the second plus copy the second times derivative of the first. So g prime is actually, if you factor out C1e uh, e to the x, you have x plus 1 in parentheses. <coughs> so now, if we are to do Ronskin with this, we have c1 e to the x, c1 e to the x, and then you have uh, c2 x e to the x, and then, oh, why did I put c1 everywhere? It's a c2 on g. Wow. So c2 e to the x, and then x plus 1. Remember the symbol? It goes like this. So I write C1, C2. When I multiply this, e to the 2x times x plus 1. So I'm multiplying. C1 times C2, e to the 2x, because x plus x is 2x. And then you have times x plus 1. And then... We have minus uh, C1, C2, X, E to the 2X. That's different than zero. Which implies independent. So if you get a zero, it's dependent system. If you get anything other than zero, it's independent. So general solution of homogeneous equations. So if the differential equation is given by y double prime plus p of x y prime plus q of x y equals zero, the solution is going to be the superposition c1 y1 of x plus c2 y2 of x. All right. So try one, one of these problems on your own. I'm giving you that the y1 is equal to 
e to the 2x, y2 is e to the minus 2x. Figure out if these are dependent or independent by using Ronsky. So what is the verdict? <laughs> Dependent or independent? Independent, very good. Independent, so this negative sign over here doesn't mean that they are minus one apart, they're not. Right, this is e to the 2x, this is 1 over e to the 2x. So completely different looking graphs. Um, constant multiple of function just stretches the function up or shrinks it. 
but it can change its shape. The shape of e to the 2x and shape of e to the negative 2x is not the same. So it's a different function. Now, together they make what? Exactly. Very good. <coughs> so y1 prime is equal to 2e to the 2x. I know, I know. And you should know. Negative 2e to the negative 2x. And when we put that in a Ronskin matrix, <laughs> that's what I did. They're right underneath, right? The functions are on top. We do that. So it's uh, negative 2 minus two. We got negative four, which is different than zero. Independent. Done deal. Now, you would put this together, right? You would put this together. And this is one of the important skills for this class for later. So, you would say that the solution is y1, sorry, c1y1 plus c2y2, which gives you c1e to the 2x plus c2e to the negative 2x. Now, I'm just going to ask you, what happens if c1 is equal to c2 and it's equal to 1 half? One more time, if c1 is equal to c2 and it's actually 1 half, what is that? Is anyone watching? Three people are watching. All right. Hello, stream. Um, yeah, they're probably screaming on the other end what it is. What is it? Yes, hyperbolic cosine. So if C1 is the equal to C2, and they're both half, it's a cosine hyperbolic. It's e to the 2x plus e to the minus 2x over 2. Well, cosine hyperbolic 2x in that case. But since C1 and C2 are not given to us, I'm just going to say, in general, if C1 equals C2, we can just write this as, uh, and then call it, I don't know, k. <laughs> then you have that this equation here is equal to k e to the 2x plus e to the minus 2x. And now you know that you need a 2. So you multiply and divide by 2. And then you get 2k cosine hyperbolic 2x. And then this 2 will get absorbed in k. So you can just say k cosine hyperbolic 2x. So this and this is exactly the same um, answer if this is uh, the case. Now, obviously, if C1 and C2 are different numbers, it's no longer hyperbolic. Bueno? Pause. All right. Now let's take a look at
linear second order equations with constant coefficients. Linear second order differential equations with constant coefficients. If you have a constant coefficient, they're going to look like a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y equals to zero to start with the homogeneous case. We'll deal with the other ones eventually. And for those, solution, solutions are y1 equals to c1 e to the r1 x and y2 is equal to c2 e to the r2 x. Insanely important to memorize this. And then Obviously, it's going to get double boxed. A lot of stuff depends on this. I don't think I can make this uglier, but it's important. So there you go. So how does this work? So here we go. Say we have a y double prime, so second order linear constant coefficients, homogeneous, all of those words. And we assume solution of the type y equals e to the rx. All right. So we need to solve this now, right? All I need to do is to take derivatives, take y prime and y double prime, and plug all in or the, the equation above. So y prime is clearly going to be r e to the r x, and y double prime is, there I say clearly, is going to be r squared e to the rx. So now, as I plug all of these, I have a times r squared e to the rx plus b <laughs> r e to the rx plus c e to the rx equals to 0. From here, you can, dare I say, clearly see e to the rx can be factored, and you get 
AR squared plus BR plus C, which equals to zero. Now we know this is exponential. It never touches x-axis. So we can divide both sides by it. We're not going to lose any solutions. And if I divide both sides by e to the r x, right, because e to the r x is always above x-axis, can be 0, we get a r squared plus b r plus c equals to 0. Guys, those are the same a, b, and c which you had in the original equation. Except now what you're looking at is not a differential equation. What is that? What? It's a polynomial, second order, called quadratic equation, right? You know how to solve this. Factoring, if that doesn't work, you have a quadratic equation. And then what type of solutions can you get? You can get two real number solutions, distinct. You can get a complex pair, or you can have a repeated solution. What do you think? Which one of these three is the dependent one? Repeated one, right? And that's the one where we actually have to sneak that x in, and it will work. Now, this equation is called characteristic equation. It has name, and you need to know that name for purposes of exams as well, because I will use that terminology. So this is called characteristic equation. So we can have distinct real roots, we can have repeated solution, we can have complex roots. They're all going to have different type of answer on the other end. So I'm going to immediately go with the example here. Say um, y double prime plus 5y prime plus 6y is equal to 0. <laughs> Solving these differential equations after you, after you learn the process is a joke. From there, you immediately write r squared plus 5r plus 6 <coughs> equals 0. That factors over what? Very good. And you get that R1 is equal to negative 2, and R2 is equal to negative 3. That's all it is. And now you write your solution to differential equation. Y of x is equal to C1 e to the minus 2x plus C2 e to the minus 3x. Done. Now, those of you who are disappointed that we didn't get to integrate, well, sorry, we didn't. And you will see that a lot of cases in differential equations, you actually don't get to integrate. So what you need to learn, part of learning before starting problems, is that characteristic equation and the differential equation, they look the same, except one has primes and the other one has r squared. So. Um, you immediately write, as soon as you see constant coefficients, you immediately write characteristic equations, solve that, and your R1 and R2 are those uh, coefficients that you put in front of x, or if thing is in terms of t, uh, in front of t, uh, for, uh, in the solution. Now, you see everything that we did so far in this section, you see it in this, in this one problem. We talked about the second order linear homogeneous equations. Now we're talking about constant coefficients, 1, 5, 6. We talked about that every differential equation second order will have two solutions, and we do have two solutions. 
But then we also learned that there is a superposition, which means that you can add them together into a single solution, which is also a solution. This solution is unique. You see it, it exists, right? And um, the process of solving differential equation did not require calculus or integrals or anything like that. It was just simply write the characteristic equation, solve those, and then just compile the solution. Now, um, I could say show that this is the answer, in which case you differentiate once, and then you differentiate once more. You plug them here, here, and here. You get the expression that it's two lines long. And then you um, go and hunt for terms that need to cancel. All of the terms have to cancel if everything is done correctly, because you must get 0 equals 0 to check. Now, as a student, I did that. I did that for every problem, because I cared. And I wanted to have you know, 105 out of 100. This class is equations. And there's really no excuse of not getting the right answer. <coughs> because, I mean, even if you don't know the concept, you learn the damn concept and you do it. But you, you can differentiate, plug back in. And if it works out, it's correct. <coughs> this is just more advanced idea, right? Oops, sorry. <coughs> the process is to subtract 3 on both sides. <coughs> Get this. And then the process to check is to plug and get 5 equals 5. There is nothing different here. You have the solution, but now it's not a number. It's a function. Big deal. Differentiate. Differentiate again. Plug this monstrosity here. It's first derivative here. It's second derivative here. You get two lines worth of writing. Just cancel. And uh, <clears throat> now, when we get this equation equal cosine x on the other side, then you better combine them in some way so it equals cosine x equals cosine x, right? But obviously, solution will not look like this because this with this gives you zero. <coughs> this has to look different so it adds up to something else. So we'll, uh, we'll discuss that. Now, um, we already got to the point where you know multiple classifications, where you know multiple methods for the first order. You know integrating factor, hopefully. You know separation of variables, hopefully, right? A little bit more stuff. Maybe. If you are using these notebooks, uh, you can start some kind of a chart organized thing on the, one of the hard covers. <laughs> if you're using notes, maybe you want to put a um, new page and then put it all the way on top. Where you are going to start, these are the classifications. These are the types of equations with their solutions. Because now, we are learning second order linear with constant coefficients. It's going to have three possible cases because roots can be distinct, repeated, or complex. So that's going to be, for this type, three. And then what do we do? Well, you can have it equal to something. Then what? Then we can have, well, wait, this could be functions, right? So you see how it piles up. And if you end up with characteristic equation with any of them, it's always branches into three different things. It is not studying differential equation from exam to exam to exam to pass. You need this stuff. This is your physics and your engineering. Those of you taking circuits this, class, uh, this time around, you will see this at work in that class. Dynamics, sure. 
physics, depending on which level is taught. Right? These are the concepts that drive everything. <coughs> and then those brave souls who actually did circuits before this class and then went there and look at it and think, what the hell is going on, right? Because, well, this is the hell that was going on. I know I had students um, when I was a student and take, taking circuits in this school. Some of my classmates did not take differential equations before circuits. Luckily, I did. So for me, it was technically just show up for the class where the rest of the people were, hell on earth, right? So it is what it is. All right, now. <coughs> I gave you this. And now I'm going to augment this with the writing underneath. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going gonna, gonna to write a new one. So here we go. It's going to have ugly boxes again. So A, Y double prime plus B, Y prime plus C, Y equals zero. It's going to be characteristic equation A, R squared plus B, R plus C equals zero, which branches into three different possibilities. R1 different than R2 real, R1 equal R2, and R1 comma R2 complex. <coughs> now, those are the three different worlds. In the first world, which is what we already covered, when you have different real answers, distinct, we said that the solution Y was C1E to the R1X plus C2E R2X. <coughs> now, when you have repeated ones, your solution is y equals c1e to the r1x. Well, just I'm just going to add equals r <coughs> because it's just one number plus c2xe to the rx. So that's that that x that we need for independence. And then we have the, the complex ones, and the complex ones will have the i, which I believe are not in this section. <coughs> yeah, whatever, they're, they're somewhere. And those are going to be uh, y equals, uh, I have to write actually, R1 would be A plus BI, and R2 will be A minus BI. Guys, you should know from a pre-calculus course that when you solve quadratic equation, you always get complex conjugate. Always. No exceptions to that rule. Well, there's no exception to any rule in mathematics. It's just math rule. So you always get complex conjugates. So in this case, y is going to be equal to e to the ax and then uh, cosine bx uh, plus i sine bx. That's how the solution is going to look like. And this is that big. So this takes care of the half of your chapter two, all right, this box. <coughs> B. 
this is the master chart for your first two or three sections of chapter two constant coefficients you have the characteristic equation which is quadratic you can have distinct roots <laughs> repeated root or complex root and depending which one you have that's how a solution looks like so once you write these you will um, immediately write the rule and as you can see no integration no nothing special you either know this or you walk away and you can't come up with this unless you know it so you gotta sit down and study this chart and do 5,000 problems and you'll be golden it is what it is so let's see <coughs> one of the examples from somewhere Do they even have anything? No? Oh, they only have you plug in. They, they actually you don't solve problems now. Yeah, you don't solve problems yet. All right, fine. You're just putting them together, the, the pieces. Um... <clears throat> I'm just going to say general solution. Maybe general solutions. And point to the chart. Because they all have... Holy nightmare, I forgot the constants. Guys, add the C1 and C2 in the complex one. So they all have C1, C2 constants. And for a particular solution, we need to compute C1 and C2 using given conditions and that's it so you will be provided that y of 0 is 1 and y prime of 3 is 7 whatever they give you something like that and then you plug those in and you compute so in the light of our previous problem whose solution was y equals c1 e to the minus 2x plus c2 e to the minus 3x, <coughs> which is a general solution. Say we are given y of 0 is, I don't know, 6, and... Um, y of uh, 1 is, oops, y of 1 is 4, doesn't matter. So let's say this is it. Then you can go and compute the solutions. Uh, y prime, sorry, y prime, 1 is 4. <coughs> so you can, you have to find the derivative, negative 2c1 e to the minus 2x minus 3c2 e to the minus 3x, and then plug in. and solve the system. So I plug in, so y is equal to 6, which is c1, and then because it's 0, so c1 plus c2. 
because when uh, when x is equal to zero, it kills the, the exponent, so e to the zero is one. Uh, now we plug the second one in the derivative, so four is equal to. Now you're plugging in one. Oh, this is going to be really annoying, but negative two over. You know what? I'm going to change this into a zero. So I can be lazy. 2c1 minus 3c2. And now you have the system. I don't care which way you solve this system. You just get c1 and c2 out. Whether it's graphing or substitution or elimination or black magic, I don't care. Just, just get the answers. Yes, the witchcraft. Some kind of witchcraft, whatever witchcraft you use, just get the answers. Uh, probably in this case, C1 is equal to 6 minus C2, and just plug it in. <coughs> Actually, no, why? Multiply by 2, top equation, times 2, done. So 12 is equal to 2C1 plus 2C2, and you have 4 is equal to negative 2C1 minus 3C2. Uh, this is 16 equals to negative C2. C2 is negative 16. And if C2 is negative 16, uh, this better be what? 22? Fine. And there's your C1, C2. So you can write the final answer y of x is equal to C1. So 22e to the minus 2x minus 16e minus 3x. And this puppy here is a particular solution. <coughs> and uh, that's it. I wish you upon the world to create that. All right, I'll see you all. Okay, let me just say bye to stream with 5,000 people there.